So, you know, there's nothing scarier than reevaluating your practices. You know, I think we all do things in our practices and we've gotten used to doing them maybe for 10 years. And it's always an interesting exercise to go back and really look at the data, what's out there that drives that process and see if it's really justified. And what I want to do today is I want to talk a little bit about a problem that comes up, at least in my clinic, every time, uh, which is looking at patients who have renal masses and trying to decide their candidacy for nephron sparing surgery, mostly from an oncologic standpoint. And we'll talk about what that means. So we've seen this evolution in the management of small renal masses. We started out taking out everybody's kidneys. We transitioned to taking out partial nephrectomies in patients with renal insufficiency. And now we've gotten to the point where we're basically approaching nephron sparing surgery in patients with T1 or T1B lesions and even some T2 lesions with normal contralateral kidneys. And the vast majority of these today are being done with minimum invasive approaches. Why is that? Well, it's a combination of technology and technique evolution, and I think surgical planning and training evolution that's driven this process. We've seen this beautiful expansion in robotics, going through multiple different robotic systems with more capabilities. We've seen the use of more effective ultrasound techniques intraoperatively that let us approach more complex tumors safely. Um, and we've got other tools like the air seal that can help us with controlling uh, the venous side of the system uh, when we do these surgeries. And, uh, and basically simplification of technique. You know, we've jettisoned most of the things we used to do that we thought were essential, bolsters, hemostatic agents, venous clamping, and all this has led us to a state where we can approach most of these tumors pretty effectively robotically. It's kind of like we have this great power, right? And sometimes when you do this surgery, you kind of feel like a superhero, right? You get this massive tumors, hilum, et cetera, and you can just take it out. And, you know, we kind of treat our residents that way. We say, look how strong we are. We can do all these cases. We can do these, you know, save these patients' kidneys. I don't know if you know this guy. This is guy's from the, the Spider-Man show. This is Uncle Ben. And Uncle Ben's famous statement, which I guess he never said in the comics, was remember, with great power comes great responsibility. And I think that's the primary topic today. What is our responsibility oncologically in these patients? And how do we make these decisions in a rational fashion? So here's a case example. So this is a patient of mine that I took care of in 2012. He's 70. He's got well-controlled hypertension, hyperlipidemia. He's got normal renal function. And we discovered this 3.5 centimeter lesion. I mean, it's not a fun one. It's three and a half centimeters, posterior, completely endophytic. Um, but again, this is definitely within our spidey kind of level of ability. And so basically, we did a partial nephrectomy in 2012. Three, three centimeter, T1, post-op creatinine, 0 0.9. Everything's great. And we followed this patient over time. I followed him for seven years. And then he disappeared for a couple years. And then came back and got an ultrasound that looked a little suspicious with a follow-up CT, which showed a three by five centimeter recurrence in the lower pole of that kidney. So late recurrence, um, visible at this point. Um, we took the patient back, did a salvage uh, radical nephrectomy in 2020, so that's eight years later. And again, 5.6 centimeters, this was a T3A with renal vein invasion, and we did get negative margins, post-op creatinine was 1.6. He's done well, he has not developed metastasis, but it's only a year out at this point, and he's doing well. Did we win or lose this battle? Did we do the right thing for the patient, or did we do the wrong thing for the patient? I think that's really the crux of what we're going to talk about today. So today's target, should preoperative oncologic factors drive our decisions concerning the suitability of nephron sparing surgery, and how do we make these decisions in this era of great power with great responsibility? And I'm, I'm going to make a few assumptions. Nephron sparing is better than nephron wasting surgery. Let's just say that up front. Okay, we think that's a good idea. Nephron sparing has a higher risk of complications, but in most patients, not all patients, there are exceptions, in most patients, that increased risk of complications is outweighed by the benefit of retaining their kidney. Obviously, some exceptions. We always have to balance complication risk and benefits in nephron sparing, maybe age and in that setting against the risk of positive margins, local recurrence, and new primary tumors. And it's always a balance. And we know it's complicated. This is not a simple description. Today, I'm not gonna give you a map that will take you from point A to point B on every single patient you see. It's more just a guidepost as to what 
you might want to think about when you're looking at these patients. Again, when we look at nephron sparing surgery, it's not solely an oncologic decision, although I'm going to focus on that today. Um, resecting more complex tumors is probably associated with higher perioperative complication risks and loss of more kidney function. And again, older and sicker patients may not tolerate complex surgery as well and perhaps might not benefit as much from nephron sparing. But we're not going to focus on this issue today. We're going to talk about the oncology. So within this framework, let's talk about this hypothetical case, although it's a real case. 54-year-old woman incidentally discovered five and a half centimeter left lower pole renal mass. No medical risk factors for renal disease, normal contralateral kidney, baseline creatinine is one, no personal or family history of a genetic syndrome. Okay, so what are we going to do with this person? Should this person have a radical nephrectomy? Should they have a partial nephrectomy? I think if we look back with self-reflection, I would look at this person in the past and say, well, they have a broad interaction with the renal sinus. It's a big tumor. They're a healthy person. They have a normal control of kidney. Why would I want to accept any additional risk? This person needs a nephrectomy. However, today, you know, Spidey can do this tumor without too much trouble robotically. So should he? That's where Uncle Ben comes in. So the fundamental questions we're going to cover are the following, and I'll cover them in order. What is the risk of pathologic upstaging of this case? So what is this case that looks like a T1 tumor? Is it a T3 tumor? And does it matter? Does it matter if that patient's got upstaging? And is there a difference between renal sinus and perinephric fat invasion? So what is the correlation between size, centrality of these tumors, their nephrometry score, whether they're endophytic or exophytic, whether they have necrosis on radiography? How does that all translate into upstaging to T3 disease? And there's some data out there on this issue. This is a multicenter trial from 2015, about 800 patients, retrospective. And they showed association with high-grade or T3 upstaging with larger tumors, so tumors greater than 3 centimeters, males, or high nephrometry scores. They didn't separate out T3 upstaging, and it's not really a very well-powered study. It's only about 3.8% of these patients had upstaging. So I'm not sure we can draw too many uh, conclusions from this. Here's another uh, study in 2020, uh, retrospective, 1,600 patients. Um, only 4% were upstaged. That number comes back again and again, and I would say 4 to 5% is a reasonable expectation for upstaging. Larger tumors were more common, higher renal score, so more complex tumors associated with upstaging. And this study did show a, a small but statistically significant worse outcome in patients with T3 disease that were upstaged. Here's a large meta-analysis published this year, almost 22,000 patients from 13 studies, and 5.7% of these patients had upstaging to T3 disease. They were older patients, bigger tumors, more complex nephrometry scores, and again, if you look at technique, patients that got radical nephrectomies were more commonly upstaged. That kind of makes sense due to surgeon bias. Um, this is an interesting one. What about tumor morphology? You know, we make these comments when we talk about these patients in clinic, oh, the, the tumor's lobulated or it's spherical. Does that make a difference? Well, this is a study uh, that looked at uh, patients with different morphologies. It's not a very large uh, number of patients, but they broke it down into three types, round tumors, lobulated tumors, kind of more of the spherical or the cylindrical tumors and these irregular tumors. And they showed that the irregular tumors were more associated with upstaging. Kind of makes sense. Lots of data in this space. I'm not have time to go through all of it. But most of the data suggests that from a long-term standpoint, there is an actual decreased five-year disease uh, uh, specific survival benefit or recur uh, recurrence-free survival benefit if the patient has a T1 versus a T3 disease. That makes sense. That difference is relatively small, so 83 to 89% five-year uh, disease recurrence-free survival is pretty similar across studies. So PT3 upstaging definitely matters, but the amount it matters is relatively small. What about these two cases? So here's one with a broad renal sinus involvement, and this is one that we would be a little more uncomfortable doing a partial nephrectomy on, and here's one with a broad renal uh, per gerotus fat involvement, and we wouldn't even blink about doing this one. Well, it turns out these two cases, this one was T1B and this one was T3, right? So that fact is that that doesn't necessarily tell us very much, and it, it's uh, perhaps not the best way to determine whether a person should get nephron sparing surgery. If you look at the outcome data, um, this is a retrospective study of 143 uh, T3 cases with 28-month follow-up. 
larger tumors, higher tumor grade, but not renal sinus versus uh, perinephric fat invasion. So no difference in time to recurrence or time to death with these two different forms of invasion. Um, so again, in this case, um, they might have a little higher risk of renal sinus invasion, um, but that probably shouldn't drive us away from doing nephron sparing surgery. The real question is, should we be doing a radical nephrectomy, right? We should, is it safer to do a radical nephrectomy? Do the patients do better? Do they end up with better outcomes in cancer control? Well, there's not much evidence of that. So if you look at the data, almost all the data that's out there on T3A uh, patients shows that they do better after partial nephrectomy. Now, obviously, that is a function of other than oncologic factors in many cases, and perhaps some selection bias in who gets radical nephrectomy versus partial nephrectomy. But there's no data showing a improvement in outcomes with radical nephrectomy in this population. Um, this is a retrospective study of 1,000 patients, no, no advantage to radical nephrectomy. Another uh, case, another 1,000 patients, mean follow-up of 48 months, no benefit to radical nephrectomy in the T3 patients. Now, one of the things is that the, nobody's really addressing the elephant in the room, which is positive margins and local recurrence in these studies. They're just looking at long-term outcomes. So let's try to touch on that. How does tumor complexity affect the risk of positive margins? That seems like a reasonable question. Uh, and does that affect outcome? Well, we know that true positive margins after partial nephrectomy have a negative impact on outcome. In fact, that negative impact is a lot greater than being upstaged from a T1 to a T3 tumor with negative margins. Accidental incision of the tumors doesn't seem to have much of an impact. So if you inadvertently cut the tumor but you recapture everything, not much evidence that that causes much of a problem. But true positive margins do. And this is different than what we used to tell people a decade ago. You know, we used to be a lot more relaxed about this, but not so much anymore. Frozen sections don't generally help you very much during these cases. But what about tumor complexity? Well, when you look at uh, this study, this is a retrospective study of about 1,000 patients. Only 2.2% had positive margins. You can see that their long-term outcomes, three-year outcomes, are significantly worse than the patients that did not have positive margins. So 99.5% versus 63%. So it's not a, a trivial factor. Um, Positive margins in this study in 2013 were the only factor associated with recurrence in metastasis, and 60% of patients with positive margins had recurrence uh, in this study. Again, when you look at positive surgical margins study in 2021, big meta-analysis, over 100,000 subjects, all of these factors, overall relapse, local recurrence, metastasis, overall mortality, cancer-specific mortality, all are worse with positive surgical margins. And there's actually a nomogram for estimating this, which is kind of interesting, study published in 2020, uh, looking at 4,000 patients. And I guess this is worth looking at at some point, um, but it shows things that you might expect and some things that maybe you wouldn't expect. So Padua score is another alternative to nephrometry scoring that is an estimate of tumor complexity. And you can see as the Padua score goes up, your risk of positive margins go up. You see that positive margins are more common in laparoscopic versus robotic and open cases, and that's sort of common sense based on the limitations of the technology. You see that when you hyler clamp, you have slightly lower positive margins because you can see better. Um, and obviously, surgeon volume is a big one. So cancer uh, center volume, when you're going down into the low volume centers, you see higher positive margin rates. So you can use this to make estimates. What about the last issue? What about de novo primary tumors uh, in the kidney that you have left in situ? So in this patient, if I do a partial and everything goes great and I'm high-fiving and it's perfect, what are the chances that that patient's kidney is just going to develop another primary and then we're going to require additional surgery? Well, the data on this one is a little shallow uh, when you look at it. So this is one study uh, published in 2017 that defined three different types of local recurrence or de novo primary tumors. The traditional type A, which is basically a positive margin where you've left behind gross tumor. Um, type B is something that occurred through microvascular or lymphatic transit of these cells. So even though this patient had a negative margin, they developed a local recurrence from the previous tumor. And then type C are the ones that we're really interested in, the ones that are just de novo, brand new primaries that had nothing to do with the previous tumor. Uh, again, not a very well-powered study, only 18 cases of local recurrence that were evaluated after salvage radical nephrectomy. But the vast minority of these were that type C variant. So most of these are related to transit from the original primary tumor. So this issue of second completely de novo primaries is a little bit uh, of a lower risk. 
So I would say that multifocality, it's really a patient-centric rather than a tumor-centric phenomenon. It may have a lot to do with their genetic risk factors, what their baseline genomic burden is in terms of tumor risk. And of course, remember that that's probably the same in both their kidneys. So again, their risk of getting a new primary in the kidney you operate on is probably not a whole lot different than the risk of getting it in the other kidney. Um, there is a lot of inter and intratumor heterogeneity in renal cell carcinoma, and we just don't have a really deep insight into the genetic background issues yet, although it's coming, uh, they'll make us, let us make these decisions. I'm gonna just give you an example. This is a research project that we've done in our lab, but it shows kind of the concept. So we've made two mouse models. This is a mouse that has a transposon system in P10, and it develops papillary renal cell carcinoma. But they generally develop papillary renal cell carcinoma fairly late, 400 days after birth, and they generally are solitary lesions. They can get quite large, but they get these solitary lesions. When we layer onto that mouse an additional genetic event, and this is in this case a constitutively active version of PMET, which is associated with papillary renal cell carcinoma, they get much earlier tumors and they get multifocality. Right? So that multifocality is in almost every single mouse. So this is a paradigm for what we see probably in humans. Right? There are going to be some that have a lot of risk factors that put them down that path towards their tumor, and they're probably going to get multifocal disease, and there are going to be some that don't have that many risk factors. Unfortunately, at the moment, we don't necessarily know that for that individual patient. So I think it's difficult to make a decision to not spare their kidney based on the assumption they're going to develop multifocality outside of a well-established genetic syndrome. All right, conclusions. So upstaging of these T1 to T3 uh, tumors of partial nephrectomy is pretty rare, about 5%, 4 or 5%, depending on how aggressive you are in your partial nephrectomies. And although that it has a statistically significant but not very large effect on long-term outcomes. The risk of upstaging is higher for bigger tumors and more complex tumors and those with irregular morphology, perhaps. And renal sinus fat invasion is not necessarily such a bad thing compared to perinephric fat invasion. And there's very little data supporting better oncologic outcomes for radical nephrectomy in these patients. Second set of conclusions, positive surgical margins are bad. They do have a very significant negative impact, much more so than the upstaging issue that we talked about. Larger tumors with higher renal scores increase your risk of positive margins, and you can estimate that risk using some nomograms. Um, given the oncologic effects of, of these positive margins, you need to consider salvage nephrectomy in these patients because they don't do well if they have positive margins. And, but there's little data out there about the risk of ipsilateral second tumors. So let's go back to our original case. What would we do? What should we do in this case? Well, this is a larger tumor. It has a high renal score. It's about 11 in this case. Um, it has a lobular morphology, but not the irregular morphology. Um, the renal sinus, clearly there's some risk here, but again, we've proven that that's not so much a, a big factor. Um, maybe consider a renal biopsy. Maybe you're not going to approach this if it's a very high aggressiveness looking tumor on biopsy. I think that that data is still not quite there. And the nomogram predicts a risk of positive surgical margins about 15%, so significantly higher than what you might see in the broad population. So I would look at this patient and I would counsel them and say, we can offer you a nephron sparing procedure there is a higher than, than average risk that you're going to have a positive margin at the time of surgery, and we may not know that, which means that you're going to have a higher than average risk of needing a salvage nephrectomy at a later date. However, if we follow you closely and we do that, you're likely going to do well. So that patient can then make that decision as to whether they're willing to take that chance of needing additional surgery for the potential benefit of nephron sparing. But what I'm not going to tell them is that this morphology of this tumor makes them not a candidate for nephron sparing surgery. Um, and so I think to some degree, Spidey wins the, the, the day on this particular case. And you have to look at this individually in every patient that you see. Thanks again for your attention.